Hello. <clears throat> uh, oh gosh, hold on. Hi everybody. Um, so I know this was originally supposed to be at uh, the Southwark Cathedral um, today to announce the uh, release of the paperback of Mama's Boy. And um, obviously I wish we were all like in a place where we could be at a cathedral. Uh, that's right out the window and right down the street there. That would have been so cool, but um, we obviously all need to keep safe. And that means keeping a little distance. But thanks to this, thanks to Instagram Live, uh, we can still have a little chat. Now, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here, um, but I'm going to try it. So if you guys want to ask questions, I think there's little questions coming in, and I'm going to see how to read them. Um, today, as you guys are writing up some questions, uh, Today would have been my big brother Marcus's 50th birthday. Um, and if you've read the book already, you know uh, who my big brother was and how important he was to me, uh, how he literally, uh, with his courage and strength, saved my life many a time, uh, how he came out unexpectedly um, when we were making milk, um, which shocked me and my mom because uh, he didn't fit any of the stereotypes of uh, being a gay guy. Um, and uh, and sadly, we lost him um, a, a number of years back now. Uh, so a uh, happy birthday to my big brother, Marcus. I can't think of a better day to be releasing this book. Um, the UK cover, there's a question. What the heck is this? Listen, if you grow up in Texas, in the United States, you are expected to play football. If you don't play football, people or American football, people are going to start to wonder what's quote unquote wrong with you. Now, I didn't want anyone, anyone ever to suspect that there was anything different about me. So I played football and I played, uh, I was a safety. So on the defense, my job was to go and try to knock the ball out of, you know, the wide receiver's hands or keep him from catching it or whatever. And I was scrappy and little and fast and I was all right at it. Um, I don't know that I enjoyed it, but I was all right at it. Um, and it kept me in a closet of sorts for a little while longer. Um, all right, uh, let, me, let me get to the questions. I guess the first question is, how the heck do you get the book? Don't go out to shops. That would be silly. Do not go out to shops to try and get this book. Uh, first of all, they're probably all closed, and if they're not, that's even an even bigger problem. But you can find it on, uh, online. Um, certainly you can, uh, even get the audiobook online, uh, if, if you like listening to it, it's something I narrated, um, and, uh, and so you get to hear my voice get a little crackly at times. All right, let me see if I can figure out these questions. Hold on two seconds. Uh, <laughs> the first question up, uh, is from Tom Daly who's upstairs right now. We just had dinner, he just made us like this vegan spaghetti bolognese. And his question is, why didn't you do the dishes before you went live? Well, that's nice. All right, that's true, I didn't, I didn't do the dishes. It's true, I didn't do any of the dishes. Uh, I, did, I did pick up my plate and put it by the sink, but I'm sorry, Tom, didn't do the dishes. It was a delicious vegan spaghetti bolognese. Um, and I'll probably be in a little bit of a pasta uh, coma before this is done. All right, another question. Uh, what inspired you to write the book? Um, all right, uh, honestly, I, I didn't have a good, I, I always say to writers, uh, don't write anything unless you have a purpose for it and that that purpose serves something in the future, not the past. Um, and I think, I hope when you get into the book, you'll realize that sadly it's, it's gotten even more topical today. Um, the book starts with a plague. It starts with a plague uh, that was, uh, you know, um, attacking particularly people living in uh, tough circumstances where there was standing water or not, uh, you know, good standards of cleanliness and all of that. And that disease was polio. And my mom caught it and my mom caught the worst kind of it, and it left her in an iron lung for a long time. Um, it paralyzed her. Um, but one of the things I think that is inspiring maybe to read it now while we're in a, a pandemic of our own is to see that it was that 
polio epidemic and my mother falling um, ill in it uh, and all that she suffered that actually gave her the hope and the courage and the strength to defy her nurses, to defy her doctors, to, to figure out how she could walk again, uh, to fall in love when every nurse said that that was never going to happen, to have three kids that every doctor said was impossible, um, and eventually to be able to understand that just because you're different doesn't mean you're wrong. My mom looked very different, but my mom came from an incredibly conservative world. Um, she was Mormon, military, grew up in the South, and she considered herself a conservative. But when she found out about me, and later my big brother, well, she wasn't just going to outright reject us. She wanted to understand what this difference was. And that took a long time, and it wasn't easy at first. But I think that that plague that she survived just barely, uh, now, gosh, 60, 70 years ago, um, is what opened this giant window uh, uh, in her heart uh, and, and taught her acceptance and what that means, taught her to value difference, uh, and she passed that on to me. So those are a lot of the reasons why I wrote the book. It, I think it is time that we examine our differences, um, that we find value in them, not fear. Uh, and certainly right now it's a good time to have that message out there that... Uh, Difficult times like these, a plague, a pandemic, uh, it, is, it is a time filled with tragedy, but be on the lookout for some silver linings. Um, uh, question, would you want to turn the book into a movie? Yeah, right now, actually, um, my uh, good old friends who I did big love with over at Playtone, which is Tom Hanks's company, um, in association with Amblin, which is Spielberg's company, uh, with the wonderful documentary director, uh, Laurent, uh, who you might have seen, uh, Five Came Back, he, he directed that. He is um, right now uh, directing a documentary version of this. So uh, not only will you get to see my mother's story, but you might get to see a bit of me um, uh, doing what it is my mom challenged me to do, which is to go back to areas where people don't necessarily agree with you and see if you can build a bridge. Wish me luck. Next question. Uh, how old was I when I knew I was gay? I was six years old. Uh, and that's a chapter in the book. And I say in the book, and I, it's true, um, I think a lot of people who are LGBT or Q... Uh, they have a suspicion there's something different about them, but they don't always know exactly what it is. Um, because I was raised where I was raised, I had a lot of words for uh, my newfound feelings, my crush on this kid down the street. And so um, I knew I was gay, and I knew that that was a problem. I knew that that was not going to go over well where I live, not in my church, not in my community. Um, and so I was pretty terrified for a very long time. All uh, right, I'm trying to, let's see if I get another question. Whoop. Nope, that turned the screen around. Now you can see Robbie's toys, or you can see my husband naked behind me. David Hockney painted these, drew these. Robbie drew that. Who's better, Robbie Ray or David Hockney? Robbie Ray or David Hockney? I, I, I don't know. I can't tell. I, honestly, I, I want to just say I love David. love David. He's a friend love what he does but i mean this is art right look at that look at that move over picasso we got robbie ray all right uh back to the questions let's see if i can open them up yeah here we go uh advice to um a young writer um you know the the only real advice i have for any writer is to keep writing uh, that's really the, any, any other advice might be helpful, but it's not always going to apply to you. You know, I, you know, for some people I say, I, I, it's probably helpful to figure out why you're writing what you're writing, what effect you want it to have. Uh, it's that kind of examining your intent, which actually might focus what you're writing. So you don't end up, you know, going astray and wasting a lot of time and energy, but honestly, it's the toughest thing to do, and it's the thing that uh, that I think uh, has the the best results, which is just wake up each day and do it again. And 
Uh, and you know, if you don't like what you read, uh, wrote the night before and you wake up and you're like, that was crap. Well, then you're a writer because that's what we do. We write, you write, you write. We wake up the next, we go to bed thinking we're geniuses. We are freaking geniuses. I just wrote the hell out of that scene. You wake up the next morning, you read it and you realize you're a fool. And that was terrible. And it's probably the worst thing that anyone has ever put down on the page. And that's what being a writer is like. And you try to fix it, try to fix it, and day after day after day. Um, and eventually someone rips it from your hands, puts it on the screen, and you cross your fingers. That's sort of how I do it. Uh, all right, next. Can you please translate it to Portuguese? I wish. I love uh, Portuguese. I've directed uh, commercials uh, for Coca-Cola in Portuguese, I didn't have a clue uh, what people were saying, but I could sense when they were being genuine or not. Um, but I don't speak the language. Someone else will have to translate it into Portuguese, but I can't wait for that day. Um, sending love from Ireland, sending love back to you. Um, someone's just asking, can I have a copy of your book, please? Sure, I don't know, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I haven't even gotten my collection yet, to be honest. I'm waiting. You know, it's a little tough right now for the publisher to send a big box of books. I don't think anyone's actually going into the office. But, you know, when I do have books and all of this uh, has passed, this coronavirus time has passed, I will do a book giveaway. And I also hope that we'll reschedule the thing over at the cathedral. But I'll give away some books as soon as I have some to give away. Um... Did you do workout this morning? Oh gosh, I am so, you know what? This morning, I did. I did, I actually did. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't for weeks, but this morning, Tom said, get on the treadmill. I got on the treadmill, and I walked at a very slow speed and not a very high incline for 20 minutes, but that's better than nothing. I almost sweat, come on. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Is there something you were going to include in the book but didn't? Um, that's a great question. You know, that's a really good question for a writer. There's a lot. I mean, it covers a portion of the time when I met Tom and started our family. And obviously that's a really, I mean, a huge part of my own story. But it didn't have a whole lot to do with the purpose of this book. And this book was more about my mother's journey and how her difficulties actually turned into... Uh, some triumphs and um, and so there wasn't a room for that story not not enough to do it right so later there'll be another book if you have a title for the book about us meeting and building our little family uh, I'll, I'll read the best ones that come up title it what should it be called um, the battery was running dry um, someone says they just bought the book um, Thank you. Uh, what was the hardest chapter to write? Um, I think uh, probably the most, there's a lot that I'd come to terms with, but the, the chapter um, where um, my stepdad is so incredibly violent that um, my big brother had to beat him off with a baseball bat so he didn't stab my mother. To death. That was a, sounds very dramatic when you say it out loud, and it was, um, but certainly not, um, it's partly why I miss my big brother so much today, um, and, uh, and uh, it was not a memory I liked going back to visit, but I think it was formative, um, and I'm glad that I shared it. All right, love from Japan, right back to you. Uh, wish we were there this year. We will see you in Japan next year. I cannot wait. Um, let's see. A lot of questions about if I'm going to translate it to a different language. You know, I would love to uh, uh, translate it to another language. That depends on you guys. Um, it has sold very well, but it has to sell incredibly well uh, to get uh, that to happen. So tell your friends to get it. Uh, there's, a, there's some questions about Liam, who's probably here watching, asking why Liam's around all the time. Uh, and Liam is uh, Tom's best friend Sophie's boyfriend. And he is around a long time.
because, and I hope no one saves this or quotes me, he's brilliant. And I asked him uh, a, a, a few months back if he would help run my company. Um, now he is working from, well actually now he's not working, he's uh, at home uh, and uh, I can't wait for him to be back. But don't tell him I said that, even though he's probably here in the room. Um, let's see. Real question, what is vegan bolognese sauce? I don't know, ask Tom, I have no idea. I just don't like eating meat. I don't eat meat, I eat fish occasionally, but that's it. So if he's gonna make me a bolognese, uh, I don't know, it had little chunks of something that he got and it was really good, but um, it wasn't me. Um, let's see. Ooh, this is a very good question. How do you cut pages in a first act to get to the action sooner without sacrificing character and story setup? Ooh, somebody's a writer. Um, I, I do a lot of outlining. And so um, that's what all those note cards are that I harass you guys with on Instagram all the time. Uh, by outlining, I'm able to, or hopefully, not always, but the attempt is to only have what's necessary in order to tell the story, in order to get your you know, characters into the position you need them in so that they have the challenges that will sustain a second act and have a fulfilling third act. Um, and there's all this stuff you want people to know about these characters, particularly in a true story where you have so much information. But an outline helps you get rid of what's not necessary before you write it. What's really hard is when you've already written your first act or your first couple chapters and you've done a great job and they're wonderful scenes, but they're way too long. You're on like page 40 in act one or you're three or four chapters and it still feels act one-ish. Um, and now you've got to cut that stuff that you did so well because you don't need it. But it's hard to cut it. They're like your babies. You gave birth to them. So I always say outlining helps you. It helps keeps you keep you from killing your precious babies. Um, that's my trick. Um, where is Tom? Tom is upstairs. I think he's probably starting to get our son ready for bed, which usually means a bath, which lately means there will be water all over the floor. Uh, because Tom doesn't seem to mind the fact that Robbie likes the, the tub as full as a swimming pool and wants to splash as much of it as he can onto his papa uh, until his papa is drenched. And, uh, you know, this is their game. I just stay away now. I stay away for dryness sake. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah, water everywhere. All right, what else we got? These are good questions, guys. Um, any tips for juggling writing two scripts at once at very different stages? Oh, I love that there's writers in here. Um, yeah, I hate doing it, but I do it all the time. I, right now I have a TV show, a movie, uh, both of them uh, at a, a network in a studio, and a top secret rock opera, which isn't quite a secret now that I just said that out loud. Um, but they are all actively being created with teams right now. And every now and then I kind of get things mixed up uh, and it's tough. I remember when I was writing Milk nine, 10 years ago, I was also writing Big Love on HBO. And every now and then a little piece of dialogue would sound awfully similar between the two. And somebody pointed out once that almost the identical line was in both Big Love and milk. Find it. Good luck. Whoever finds that definitely gets a free book. The, um, uh, but my trick is always um, to really separate, if you have to do them in the same day, separate them with some physical activity. Get out of your head, get into your body, whether that's a workout or cooking something or you know, taking a walk. I think walks are incredibly important for writers. Almost as important as coffee. Not quite, but almost. Um, and, um, and that sometimes gets you out of thinking. And that means when you re-engage, you're fresh. And, um, and so that's always been my trick is to go to the gym or take a walk um, before I switch to a new script. All right, someone's asking about self-isolation. And I find, I find it difficult or challenging to continue to focus. Uh, the answer is sort of no. Like, can I, I want, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. 
pretty much self-isolation and quarantining is what writers do every day. We work out of our home usually. Uh, usually there's no one around. I don't leave my house often because there's a giant amazing coffee maker that Tom got me that's like right out of an American diner and it's sitting on a shelf over there and I love it. Um, and so uh, pretty much if it weren't for having my husband and our son and my mother-in-law here, those are my quarantinis, because um, they're usually not here, it's usually just me and sometimes Liam, uh, then I might not know. I might not know this, except that it's awfully quiet outside. So I'm, I've actually gotten a lot done, um, and the breaks are even nicer than usual because I get to go upstairs and have cuddles with my mother-in-law. No, that's not true. I'm kidding. I, I definitely did not cuddle Debs Daly. No, 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 no. She, she doesn't love me. She loves uh, vodka, and uh, I, I'm somewhere in second place, or third, or fifth, uh, depending on my behavior, which is usually bad. Um, uh, all right. Was it difficult to find some of the information about my mom? Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um, it was, it was a, it be, because if you've read the book, you know I lost my mom before I started writing the book and, um, and that shouldn't ruin the book even if you haven't read it yet. But, uh, I, so I was actually a lot of digging and researching, but it's the kind of work that I've done for all of my films, for most of my films, the main based on true story ones, the main subjects are not around anymore and I have to do research. Now doing that kind of research with your, mo with your mom is really interesting because you find out, you find love letters she wrote to priests when she was 14, trying to convince them to leave the priesthood to marry her and you go, wow, my mom was a, you know, she was a, a, a determined gal. Um, and, uh, you know, and seeing the picture she saved of all of these guys she would write letters to who were out in Vietnam fighting the war and she would send pictures of herself from here to here. And she's, she looked quite normal from here to here. It's only when you saw below that you saw the scoliosis and the braces and crutches and stuff. And they would send pictures back. And so looking through my mom's album of, I call it her golden book of boys, of all these photos she saved of these cute, very cute soldiers um, from Vietnam, I realized my mother and I have the same taste. That was confirmed when I met Tom and caught her Googling pictures of him in Speedos uh, on her iPad in bed one night. Um, it's a true story. I mean, we're here for the truth. Uh, <clears throat> how much coffee do you drink a day? Not enough. I've tried. Uh, not enough. Uh, Uh, I, Cheryl, I think his name says she, after reading the book, you wanted to reconnect with your family. I, I, I can't suggest that enough. Uh, and, and part of what this book was, was me reconnecting with my Southern, uh, family, many of whom are conservative, some of whom have said homophobic things in the past. And, um, it was really a testament to my mom's well, her lessons of having courage and, and curiosity enough to ask questions about my gay friends that I went back and met with so much, so many of my family who I thought I had nothing in common with and quickly learned that they are fabulous. We might not vote for the same people, but they are fantastic and I love them. And those reconnections have been so, so wonderful. And yes, they defy the times and they defy the news. And uh, they defy the belief that people of different political persuasions can't be family and friends. Uh, I'm gonna use a bad word. Fuck that shit. You know what I mean? Uh, I know politics is important, and to me politics is quite important, and I know it shapes our lives and protects us, but at a certain point, it ought not come between family and neighbors. All right? There is a higher plane than politics. Um, uh, da, 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 let's see. Why do we not share our son's face? I've answered this a thousand times. He's so incredibly cute that it'll make every single parent in the planet, you know, jealous. And why would I do that to them? It'll break all of your hearts because he's the cutest creature, honestly, to ever be born. So I, I just don't want you to feel bad about your own baby pictures. And, um, and, uh, and so, uh, 
We're not showing his face. That, and it keeps him safer here in the UK that has a lot of paparazzi who like to chase uh, folks around. It keeps them from doing that. Um, all right. Couple, I have a, a few more minutes, right? Uh, what's the number one thing you recommend to writers when telling their own story? Oh God, I mean, Oh, it's freaking hard. Uh, take your time. Uh, I do suggest, I always say outline, outline, outline. Definitely do it with your own story. And then maybe share that outline out loud with friends or particularly writer friends because you're going to think that every single thing that happened in your life is really, really interesting. And that's just not true. It's just not true. And so it helps you whittle it down to just what you need. Um, and to that point, Figure out what you need. Why are you writing this? You're not writing it just to tell people what happened to you. You better have a reason for it. You better have a, better have a purpose. Use your writing as little, like, chaos bombs. And when I say chaos, I mean something good. I, I like, I think every now and then we need a little bit of chaos where no one gets hurt, but it shakes things up, makes people look at things different, breaks things up so that they can reform in a better way. How does your book or your movie do that? or your poem, or your song? How does it make people, how does it shake things up? Um, hello from San Antonio, hi back to you. Uh, hometown. Um, the most surprising part of writing this book for me was, um, gosh, two. I think the reconnection with my own family, um, understanding how strong we'd always been, that we were always still there for each other, that there, what I said earlier, there was, is that higher plane than politics. Um, but also my reconnection with my roots, uh, my Mormon roots in Utah, and understanding that there are people within my childhood church who also feel that the Mormon church treats women and LGBTQ people unfairly, um, that I'm not alone in that belief, that there are people within the church who believe that, um, and that with more work and more conversations, we might see more change within a church like that, uh, which in the end makes life safer for a lot of kids. Um, and that's what this is about, isn't it? Right? I'm strong. I'm going to be fine uh, as an LGBT person, but there are a lot of youngsters out there uh, who are still being told that they're sick, that they are wrong. Utah still has one of, if not the highest incidence of, of uh, youth homelessness and suicide. Most of that is LGBTQ homelessness and suicide. That's why we do what we do. It's not for us, it's for the next generation. Um, and it's been heartening to see that the book has had a positive effect there. Um, mm, mm, oh, thank you for the congratulations on the release. Uh, I, someone just asked if I could explain the note card concept of breaking story. Not here, but you know the Academy, like the Oscar Academy, did this video of me explaining it a few years back. I still have a lot of bangs in the video. I'm sorry, it's a warning. Um, but the, uh, it, it's, I think it's called Creative Spark, something like that, Dustin Lance Black. Look it up, um, and, and I explain it there. I hope it helps you. Um, uh, where can we meet once Corona blows over? Are you kidding me? A coffee shop, a museum. I mean, I, I have some predictions about the other side of this Corona thing. You want to hear them? Uh, I, I, I think, yes, there's, it's going to be a time filled with tragedy. Uh, it's going to get tough tougher before it gets better. But on the other side of this, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of amazing meals. People are going to travel again. And this, I think there's going to be a massive baby boom. So I know things like the stock market are suffering, but my plan is to invest heavily in baby formula and prams and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as this starts to fade, because I have a feeling people are busy in their quarantine doing all kinds of things that make babies. Um, just my theory. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, advice on finding queer love during quarantine? I have no idea. 
I'm taken, man. Um, are you coming to Philly after all this is over? Yes, I'm just gonna go through a few of these really qu uh, quickly. Any news you can share on the docu-series? My documentary um, that I'm shooting, filming right now, is on hold. We stopped filming just like everything else. Uh, you know, we all gotta do our part um, and, and this time. Do you want another baby boy or a baby girl? Why do I have to choose between the two? Can't I have a few of both? Uh, uh, all kidding aside, I would love, love, love to have a daughter. Don't tell Tom, but I would love to have a daughter. Um, the, uh, doo -doo, and then just a couple more minutes, because what's going to happen right now is my battery's going to die, because I'm terrible at this. Um, thoughts on the 2020 election? Well, it'll come as no surprise that I believe... Uh, we need to change the occupant in the White House. And that is number one for me. And I will do whatever it takes to get someone back in the White House who believes in things like honesty and serving the broader public good. And perhaps even that difference is valuable. Uh, and uh, I'll do whatever it takes to get that kind of person in the White House. It's looking like that's going to be Joe Biden, and if that's who the nominee is, I'm all in. But no matter who that nominee is on the Democratic Party, I'm all in. Um, uh, all right, someone said Bernie. Fine, if Bernie somehow miraculously gets the nomination, I'm all in. I've already said it. All in. You know, I, I, I actually think, and then I'll leave politics behind, but I actually think we were spoiled in the Democratic primary with a lot of uh, wonderful candidates who were very sincere and very capable. Um, and uh, honestly, I will take any of them over what we have right now because I think lives depend on it. Um, uh, right, I should probably wrap. How's my hair doing? It's getting longer. How's your heart? You know, it's, it's fine. It does, it's been all right. I, at night, when I have a glass of rosé, it's even better. Um, and uh, how do you celebrate your mother's and your brother's life? I think that's a good one to end on. Um, I, in, in the book, and this might ruin a little something, the last words my other mother ever said to me uh, was, fight for my life. And of course, I, f I hear our son, of course I feel like I failed to keep her alive, and that was very, very difficult. But it made me question what her life meant, uh, what it symbolized, what I learned from it. Um, and that's why I wrote the book. Uh, my mom and my brother's lives were lives worth fighting for. And that's because they believed that there is no gulf between family, between neighbors, between uh, human beings that is too wide not to build a bridge across. And, uh, you know, sometimes that optimism proved foolish, but most of the time she was right. If you're willing to sit down with somebody and share personal stories, not politics, not science, not the law, not all the arguments that, yes, might be on your side and they're, they're valid and they're worthy, but those just lead to fights. If you're willing to sit down with someone and share your heart, you can build a bridge. And that's what my mother's life stood for. And though I lost her and my big brother, I believe it is something worth fighting for. And that is how I honor their lives. Uh, and I hope, I hope if you haven't yet, you can read their stories because they're very inspiring. You don't hear, you hear a lot about me, but it's mostly about uh, my mother and she and I and our unexpectedly uh, close relationship and the great things it led to. All right, I am out because I just heard our little one heading towards the bathroom, which means that the water fight is on. Um, if I don't get up there soon, our bathroom will be under at least two to three feet of water. Um, and so I figure I gotta like intervene soon before Papa and Robbie drown out the entire neighborhood. We can't, we've, we can't deal with that right now. We just can't deal with it. All right, love you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll do this again once I have some books in hand uh, and I'll do a little bit of a giveaway. All right, thanks guys. Love you, bye.